My name is Emily Dowdle. I'm a senior inventive scientist in the data science and AI research org at AT&T Labs. Um, and I've been there now about four years. Um, so I'll be speaking with you today about what I called iterative research and practice. And essentially what I mean by this is I often think about the problems that I work on in three distinct but certainly not independent ways and revisiting it from these, from these angles. So the first is the question you want to answer. How do you define it? Um, the second is how do you want to solve that problem? How do you want to approach that, that question? Um, and the third is how do you actually code and deploy a solution um, to that problem? So um, in, in thinking about sort of how you go back and forth between those, it is always the case, almost always the case, that the limitations um, in place from one of those, those phases can inform your choices for another. Um, and so I'm going to be talking today about a project I've been working on at at and for almost a year now. Um, I've been working on DirecTV advertising for a little over two. And in this particular one, we, we often found that there would be a method that did not have a scalable implementation. Um, or there would be a method that worked, but it didn't quite capture the nuance that we wanted, in which case you then sort of tweak the method. Um, and both of those become really interesting research problems in and of themselves. So I'll start with the problem statement here. So as I mentioned, I'll be talking about advertising. Um, for some context, AT&T serves over 20 million households with uh, advertising across its, its uh, cable platforms. So we have DirecTV satellite, which is sort of your standard. You have a set-top box, you turn on the TV. DirecTV now is the streaming service. And then Uverse is sort of a cable equivalent in certain parts of the country. Um, so for DirecTV satellite, a certain fraction of those households that have that service um, have return path uh, set-top box capabilities, meaning their set-top boxes return data to us so we can learn information about preferred programs and viewing habits, things like that. Um, and so in this case, what we want to be doing is for t uh, satellite TV, which I'll be talking about today, the goal is it's always sort of there are two flavors here. We have addressable advertising, which is targeted, meaning that if you and I turn on our TV at the same time and we both are addressable capable, an ad spot might come up and I see one ad and you see something completely different. Um, the alternative is linear TV advertising is sort of the standard. This is kind of the, the way it always was, which is where an advertiser buys a specific time on a specific show and you capture whoever happens to be tuning in. It was often based on sort of inferred gender and age demographics graphics, which are becoming somewhat obsolete as targeted advertising is all around us. But it still represents a really big piece of advertising budget. So anything we can do even a little bit to improve reach and accuracy is a pretty big value add. Um, so what we're doing here is we have these TV program engagement features. We have this return set top box data. We can gather these engagement features that tell us how and when people are watching and how engaged they are with programs. And we use that then to predict an advertiser's audience, what we know to be their relevant audience or expect to be. Um, that can come to us in one of a few different ways. I won't focus on that too much. But the goal then is once we're able to predict their relevant audience, we can sort of infer what we know about their viewing to recommend specific shows or programs for linear ad buys. So that's sort of the goal here. So as a framework for what those engagement features are, our advertising colleagues in Xander, which is AT&T's ad group, um, had come to us with some features for um, root and attribution literature. And so the original ones were frequency, which is how many unique airings of a program a household watches, um, the event recency, which means how many days since their last viewing event for a program, duration, how much time they watch, and consumption method is how they watch it, essentially. Um, and so these are a really good starting point, but as you may imagine, um, the nature of television programming is that there are different shows of different lengths. You can have a 30-minute show versus a movie, maybe two hours. Um, they can air at different frequencies, so every day versus maybe once every other week if it's a special, that kind of thing. So we had to normalize these to account for those um, discrepancies, essentially. And we also had some information about um, how engaged people are by how they tune away at commercials. That actually, um, there's been some work within research to show that if you, the more you flip around, the more engaged you are with the show if you continually come back to it, which, which makes sense, but is a little bit unexpected. So to give you a sense of why this problem was challenging from a computational aspect, I'll sort of move through these three phases here. To give you a sense of scale, 
three months of primetime viewership data yields about 75,000 programs for more than 10 million households is what we were looking at. Um, and so the data sort of comes to us in this long format here. I sort of have a blue and a brown house, and they represent two individual households. And then for every program that household watches, we have these different engagement features. So often big data problems are because you have log data that can be millions, billions, trillions um, of observations. In this case, that was certainly a difficulty of the starting point. But when we went to do the modeling for this work, the additional challenge that was somewhat new to us was how wide it was once we cast it for modeling. So what happens here, um, you're just sort of turning uh, each household now has its own row in our due data set. And we now have, for every one of those programs, all the engagement features. And if a household did not watch a program ever, they were filled in with zero, which made numerical sense um, in this context. So I'll be referring in a bit to what's called a group. And what I mean by that is you can see that program A has X number of features associated with it, and program B has X number of features. Those features, when you look at sort of a, a data frame or a data table, you don't necessarily get the fact that those columns, those columns, those X columns are related to each other, right? Um, that's somewhat lost. But the idea that we want to take into account is that they are actually a group of features for a program. So some modeling considers, considerations that we did, we first thought about can we cluster the data to identify popular programs? And that seemed at first like a viable solution, um, but we quickly realized that we'd just be picking up popular programs, which was an ideal. We wanted to identify programs that were uh, differentiating our relevant audience from the rest of the DTV universe. So we knew we wanted to do classification at that point. Um, additionally, there's kind of this optimization aspect. As I mentioned, we want to optimize reach among the relevant audience, minimize to some extent the overlap between the programs we're recommending. We don't want the same people seeing a billion ads for this, um, that sort of thing. Um, and as well as the cost of the final recommendation. So obviously buying an ad spot costs money depending on the program and its popularity, those sorts of things. So typically, uh, modeling approaches for big data takes on one of three options somewhat. So you can take a sample, and as statisticians, that's always kind of our first, our first move. Um, you can move into a parallel implementation, which at AT&T Labs is, is very common. Um, or in this case, what we ended up doing is split and conquer, and I'll talk a little bit about why. So what that meant is we split up our training data into chunks, trained a model on each chunk, and then ensembled them together for final prediction. So moving into approach and methodology, I'll talk about two models that we ultimately ended up comparing um, that were of interest to us. So the first here is group regularized regression, also known as group lasso. And to give you a little bit of, of uh, intuition here, so the loss function for group lasso is just sort of your familiar residual sum of squares with a shrinkage penalty, just like a typical lasso. But the shrinkage penalty here is kind of neat because it applies to the entire group, that entire program's features, meaning that a program's features will either be all included in the model or all dropped from the model. So it also gives us some variable selection by program, which is pretty cool. Not everything was gonna do that. Um, it's parametric, so there's quite a bit of tuning involved, um, but as I mentioned, it captured that group structure. One of the problems, as I mentioned, there was no scalable implementation here. Um, and so my colleague, Ritwik Mitra, who has been my partner in all this, um, actually coded up the entire thing in Scratch in R, um, which is our workhorse language for sure. Um, so that was sort of, it's a project all on its own. Um, interpretation, we come up with essentially a program importance. So this is helpful from the coefficients in this case, but that's how we get to the final program list recommendation from the initial prediction of a household as uh, relevant, non-relevant. Um, and it's interpretable. So because you have coefficients, the scale and the direction um, is intuitive and, and interpretable. Performance was not great. Um, and you'll see that in a moment. It just it didn't do quite what we wanted, although we really liked the intuition behind it. So we also looked at XGBoost, which I think has been a, a contributor to most of the winners of Kaggle, Kaggle competitions. Um, it's known for mo model performance and speed, and in our case, it handles sparsity very well. Um, so as I mentioned, that wide matrix, you can imagine that not every household watches every of each of the 75,000 programs. Um, so it, it did that well. Um, there is a stable out-of-the-box implementation. There is a package in R. That was great. Um, interpretation, so 
you have from tree-based methods very often kind of a variable importance score. Um, but again, this was not at the program level. It was at the program feature level. So we did have to roll that up to a program level. Um, and there's no directionality to it. So it's not quite as intuitive, um, but still helpful information nonetheless. And it did much better. So where have we been using this? I'll go first through. Uh, performance measures um, so that you can see sort of how our two final ones performed here. So misclassification error, exactly what it, it sounds like on our test data. Um, we looked at sensitivity and specificity. And one of the key challenges here is that high specificity was easier to achieve um, at the cost of sensitivity because of the fact that the data, the um, distribution of households is very zero inflated. Meaning if you think about all of the, pro the households um, in our universe here, it may be the case that a very small portion are within the advertiser's relevant audience. So sort of a an intuitive understanding of this, say that you have 100 households, um, two of which are in the relevant audience. If you do a naive approach and you label them all non-relevant, your true negative rate's gonna be 100% because you got all 98 of those right, um, but your true negative rates, true positive rate is going to be zero. Um, we also looked at top 20% lift, which is a pretty common business metric. Um, all this does is we take our predictions on the test data and we order the probabilities in descending order. We cut off, look at the top 20%. What percent of true positives do we capture there? So if we capture 80% of true positives in the top 20% of predictions, that's a lift of four, 80 divided by 20, and that's really good. So use cases, we've done this. You would imagine that viewing habits on television translates pretty nicely to other TV shows that you watch and movies that you may want to see in theaters. So those have been our two use cases. So we've been looking at what are called tune-in campaigns, which is when you see an ad that's like, tune into the show next week at 9, um, and also theatrical release, so when a movie is coming out in theaters. So we had done four proofs of concept, and one of them was for a superhero movie uh, that came out. And you'll see here the results from group regularized regression XG boost. Um, in both cases, you see in the results in the top 10 programs some superhero movies. So that's kind of, that's nice, that's intuitive. Um, XG boost, you see a few more than the group lasso. Um, and I'll just mention some of that index there. It's great if you can say, reach 70% of the target with a program. But if you're also reaching 70% of the DirecTV universe with that program, you haven't actually gotten an enrichment of the relevant audience there. So it's not super. So what you really want to see is a program that reaches 80% of the relevant audience, for example, and maybe 20% of all DTV households. So it's that proportion there, just that, that easy division that's giving us the index. So anywhere you see that being over one, that represents an enrichment of the relevant audience from that program. Um, so I'll just point out quickly, you see some programs in the group Lasso where they're sporting events and the index is only slightly above one. What tended to happen quite a bit was that it picked out really popular programs. So sporting events, things that a lot of people were tuning into, whereas XG Boost did a really good job at finding programs that had really good reach as well as a pretty high index. Um, and we had some other metrics that we tagged on for business purposes to explain these results in an in a intuitive manner. Performance metrics here, I'll just show you. I'll point out the lift um, for XG Boost was 4.5, so it was pretty good. And misclassification error was only 3% versus 20% uh, for Group Lasso. So I mentioned um, the computational piece that this was sort of this quote unquote big data problem. And this is the stuff that I find really fun. So how do you code this up? Can we break some stuff and then try again, essentially? Um, and, and that's what we did. So um, the typical R workflow we realized very quickly would not scale. We sort of knew that going in. Um, so whether if you use did, uh, Tidyverse, or in my case, I'm a big data table user for your data processing, and then you know, shiny ggplot2, Trellis scope, all really nice for its visualization. Um, and then your modeling, you have some really good, we, we knew we wanted a tree-based method to start. Um, so that's why those were there. We knew that didn't work, um, and so at that point, you sort of have to think about, well, how do you choose a tool of all of the ones you know are available to you? Um, and so here were some of the things that Ritwick and I thought quite a bit about. So what does our team already use and, and who do we have working with what tool and, and on what sorts of things? Um, we really wanted to learn something new. So we had a reason to do it and then it's really about how much time you have to do it. Um, Existing data architecture and backend support is huge. Obviously, you can only use what's available to you. Um, and data handling, computational performance also came into play quite a bit here. The big thing, though, as I mentioned, doing something 
seeing if it worked, and if it didn't, trying something else. So in the big landscape of tools, this always sort of makes me chuckle. It's just so big. Um, this is where I think the meetups have been hugely helpful um, and that you sort of know what's state of the art right now in the data science community and among our users. As I mentioned, um, we all work in R and so that's sort of what we want to be doing. Uh, so we sort of found some things that were familiar to us that our group is using. Luckily, we have some fantastic computer scientists within labs um, who were incredibly helpful. But you see here, so we already were using Hadoop for other things, H2O and Spark. Um, you know, we're all viable options here. Um, so what we ended up doing, we work within an HDFS environment. So I'll just briefly explain sort of our setup. And as I mentioned, of course, anything you can do is conditional on this. But so to start, we have a Hadoop um, framework. That's where our data is stored. It also, you know, we have access to MapReduce and those sorts of things. Yarn is the job scheduler and handles how resources are allocated. Um, so that's a shared framework across all of the researchers at labs meaning that no one person can take over the entire cluster, um, which was a little bit of a bummer for us because we wanted the whole cluster, but you know, you do what you can. So then on top of that, I won't go too into detail in all these, but here were some of the, the tools that we considered. Um, so Hadoop MapReduce, um, you know, I think some people think it's becoming obsolete, but ultimately it still does stuff pretty well. Um, so it's a batch processing tool. Uh, it doesn't read anything in memory, so there is a time component to the reading and the writing to disk. Um, and if you're going to be building a model, it needs to be um, parallelizable. It needs to be able to run in a distributed way. Um, Spark and H2O, oh, well, let me briefly say, Hive is sort of like a SQL backend to um, Hadoop, so it sits on top of it and you can do interactive queries at scale. That was really helpful for some initial EDA when we didn't know what we were working with. Um, Spark and H2O we also considered, um, again, distributed um, frameworks here. They handle data a little bit differently so that uh, Spark in particular reads data into memory, um, which is great, and we were able to do that. But then you also need the, the, the memory for computational overhead. And that's where we kind of ran into the problem of we could only have so much of the cluster. Um, so of course, we're here to talk about R, and luckily all of these have interfaces in R. So you can use R on the front end and interact with these things on the back end. Um, we ended up using Simon Urbanic, he's a colleague of ours, and he wrote HMR, which is to do MapReduce for R essentially. Um, and that was really helpful for a lot of our data processing and wide casting. Um, Sparkly R and R Sparkling and H2O are also really great options for doing this, um, for building models through R um, on bigger data. So the next challenge, we are now moving into AWS, and so I'm excited to hear some talks later today and tomorrow about moving a, a pipeline into production, because um, that's where we're headed. Um, and in the meantime, just huge thanks to Ritwick, who is, as I mentioned, been my colleague in all this, um, as well as our other collaborators. Thank you.